Jesus and Harris, I um, started calling him the man who rises from the top of the hills. And there are probably only two or three guys in the room who have said that often is in the room. So you've probably seen already pictures of uh, me with Jason Harris with uh, Glenn as the uh, Ken as the stand. And all the time, I'm going to all the time. All the time, yes. And a friend of mine, a French guy, uh, being at this meeting. And so Jason Harris is a guy who isn't afraid of uh, uh, being wet, even in front of girls. He doesn't care. He hasn't. He, he is also not afraid of being at the border of a hill. Not like just me, and there is probably like I don't know, 300 meters, like like emptiness. But it is. It's not only that he's brave, it's just that he is unconscious. Just he doesn't realize. But he comes back and goes, "Whoa, that was actually an eye and slippery." And I was like, yeah, and you almost died. And the, the two next pictures, you have to look actually closely because it's going to be very fast because I could have a problem with, with, with parents or some kids because they are not safe for work. Have you seen this one? I'm sure you did it again. I, I did the whole thing again. That's, uh, if you ever do some keynote, it's shift error for only one thing. So all right, here comes the last one, the very last one, because there's actually, actually there's another one. Huh? It's coming! And there's another one! That's why I'm calling him the man who rises from the top of the hill. Because he actually really rises. And by the way, I spoke to you about the genesis of objective, objective cologne. And this picture might also be the genesis of objective cologne. It's um, us at this midi, and actually, at that single moment, if I stood up, we won't have any, any guy presenting the next talk because there was also, he could have also fallen. Um, yeah, and so, ladies and gentlemen, my very good friend, coming right from San Francisco, Jason Harris. <laughs> That was quite an introduction. Um, <laughs> I'm good I've rarely it. been introduced before uh, with demonstrations of my uh, mixturation skills. <laughs> but what can one say? Um, also, thank you for the, for the previous speakers. The talks have been really above and beyond what I expected. I mean, I figured it would be great, but these have been really an impressive talks. I've learned a lot, they've been interesting. It's been very, very nice. <clears throat> so, we're going to talk about something a little bit different. We're not going to talk about software, we're not really going to talk about business models. We're going to talk about something a bit more in the physical world, physicality, bitches. We're going to talk about making peripheral hardware, specifically for use with iOS, but kind of just more generally the, the market for peripherals, uh, what's involved with making them, and specifically why now is the time to get into making peripherals. But before we get into this, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm somewhat qualified to, to talk about this. Um, I'm mostly known in the Mac and iOS world. Uh, my first big product was called Shapeshifter, which was something that was quite popular for the early days of OS X. It was something that let people change the appearance of the operating system. It was what's commonly referred to in the technical world as hacky as shit. Uh, <laughs> I think that there were over 200 patches to operating system calls. But um, it was something nice to work on because a lot of people that are the very well known graphic designers today got to start with Shapeshifter. So it's kind of a really nice position. Um, then I also wrote something called Chicken of the DNC, which uh, is stupid name, but uh, <laughs> um, And that was an open source DNC client, and there was nothing really better to, to be done. Um, I was a little bit infamous for a couple of things. There was a uh, program that had some smoking windows while the discs were being burned called Visco. I still have it. You're the only one. And I wrote the smoke for those. And the smoke was not really all that impressive, but it was cool because it was all written as GPGPU stuff on, uh, on graphic shaders, which 
this was before OpenCL existed, so it was actually quite tough to do. Um, and it was cool from a marketing point of view for the disco guys, and it was fun for me to write, and yeah, infants. Um, and then most recently, uh, I did all the user interface for a very well known consumer graphics, I'm sorry, consumer finance package. Um, but I can't say what it is, but if you think about it, you know what it is. Uh, and that's pretty cool. It's fun having your stuff be printed in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Anyway, where I'm going with this is that despite the fact that I've been doing software for a decade, I'm actually an electrical engineer. And somewhere in the midst of this decade, I managed to print and working with the throttle for a missile, which fortunately was never actually built, which I'm happy about because I want missiles with my work being shot at people. Uh, and I'm kind of getting back to my electrical engineering roots now and working, starting a boutique hardware and science studio. So, I don't know if this qualifies me to talk about peripheral hardware, it probably qualifies me more than, than the average program to talk about. So, let's move on. The agenda. First, we're going to talk about what I actually mean when I talk about the peripheral, because we sort of have a bifurcation in peripherals. We have the things that we've been thinking about as peripherals for the last 15 years or so, but today we're kind of seeing a new a split. Uh, we're seeing a new brand of smart and that's what I'm going to be talking about. So we'll just do a bit of definition at the beginning. We'll talk about why it has been very difficult to get into this market in the past. Basically, doing stuff in the physical world, it's tough. It's really difficult to do. There's a lot of pain points that you don't have in software. And so I'll kind of go through those uh, and talk about how so that I can then knock them down and say, hey, now it's easy. Uh, we'll talk about communication. The smart peripherals that I'm going to be discussing, they are not standalone. Things that are going to be communicating with your computer or your smartphone or whatever, but they're not standalone the devices. They're talking to the outside world. Um, so, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about the pain and we'll talk about the pleasure. We'll knock down all the pain points and talk about how things are now much easier than they used to be. And a big thing that's driving this newfound ease is what's called Bluetooth Smart. Uh, this started out as Bluetooth 4, Bluetooth Low Energy, they're, they're having a they're like Microsoft and Metro. Uh, anyway, they're, they've now set a lot of them to smart, and that's what uh, allegedly they're calling for. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about the perfect peripheral storm. There's a couple of different trends in the world and in the marketplace that are coming together now that's going to make this market massive in the next couple of years. So, without further ado, let's get started and talk about what I actually mean when I talk about peripheral hardware. Okay, this horrible Bluetooth headset thing see on the screen, this is what we used to think of when we, when we talk about peripherals. It's, it's something physical. It's a physical device. It's been manufactured somewhere. It has to get to the user. It's distributed. It's probably has shelf space. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. It's probably portable. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but it's probably portable, which kind of implies it has some sort of ergonomics to it. Uh, obviously, this is not <laughs> what you want it to look like. Um, as I said, it's probably going to be communicating in some way. Uh, that can be via a bunch of different modalities. It can be over a cellular path, which means it has a SIM card built in. Um, you can think of uh, well, you can think of your smartphones. I mean, in the, in the old days, this could have been considered peripheral. Um, it can be over Wi-Fi, which is well, uh, there's a ton of these. Uh, via Bluetooth and Zigbee, or even more exotic protocols. But there's a ton of different. So you wire your wire. You can use your, your 30 pin dot connector and plug directly into, uh, into your iOS device. Um, we call this a dongle, but that's not really the word that we use all that often today. But uh, there are pluses and minuses to both. Um, and finally, it can be something that's generic. It can work with any smartphone, any device, or it can be something that's very tightly integrated with an app. So as most of us are app makers, we probably want it to be the latter. But if you wanted to sell really well, maybe you wanted to be there. So these are things that you, that you think about when you're defining what you mean by a peripheral. So these are some of the modern peripherals that I'm thinking of during the context of this talk. What you see on the screen right now is the Fitbit. You got one? I've, I've never actually seen one. I'd like to look at That's <laughs> what I'm going to think Okay, so it's 50. It's, it's small, it's nicely designed. What is that? 
Okay, I'm about to show a picture of it. <laughs> um, so these, these are modern peripherals. They're well designed. They've taken a lot of their design cues from Apple. Uh, they try and be compelling as far as their appearance. They try and be very, very simple as far as their interface. Uh, and they're, they're, they're smart and they're elegant and they're well built. Um, this is the Withings scale. It's an internet enabled scale. Basically, you weigh yourself and then five minutes later, your weight shows up on a nice chart on your iOS device. Um, this is the Nike Fuel. This is what I think Ethan said that you have. I haven't seen one of these either, actually. I'd like to see it. Throw it! <laughs> <laughs> and again, you can see that this is something that's quite compellingly designed. It looks cool. It's something that you know people see it and they go, hey, what's that? He's a really awesome uh, And last but not least, this is the Pebble. This is a smart internet enabled watch that's been on Kickstarter over the last few months. Uh, that got tons of press. And basically, this is something where your smartphone tells your watch that you have a Facebook status update or a Twitter message, and then your watch tells you, and you can just look at the watch and you go, oh, okay, so I'm going to do sure in my talk at Objective Gynecology. Great. <laughs> so, basically, that's what I mean by, by the modern version of peripherals. So, let's start getting into the main points. We'll talk about the physicality. Basically, if you make something physical, you have to get it certified. And there's a ton of different certifications that need to be done. Uh, and these certifications depend on what the device is, how it's operating, what sort of um, what sort of things it can do, and where you plan to sell it. Almost something something that almost always needs to be certified is radio frequency noise. So basically. They have to certify that your device is not going to interfere with the other stuff around it. Specifically, like if you go to a hospital, it's not going to be the entire hospital to stop you getting hungry. So these certifications are expensive and difficult to do. Um, I think a standard uh, radio frequency certification probably starts at about thirty thousand dollars. So you need a bank. You need some some money to do this. Um, if you're in the US, then you need to get your FCC certification. This basically says that your device not only will it not make the hospital go down, but uh, it's going to um, not cause other massive problems in the US. So, this is a second certification, and we have to do this as well. Um, if it's something that's going to be plugging into the mains, into the wall outlets in the US, then it also needs a UL certification. And I mean, I bring these up just to, just to say that. Physicality is a bitch. You have a lot of different certifications that need to be done. If you plan on selling in Canada, then you also need to get your Canadian UL. Uh, but there's actually two different Canadian ULs, so you do not have to get both or one or either or neither. Screw Canada, who knows? Um, if you want to sell in Europe, you have to add your CV under that as well. And then if you want to be in other countries, the Asian countries and the South American countries, uh, they have different certifications, and this very quickly becomes a morass of different certifications, and you run out of space in your, in your packaging for the logos. Then, if you wanted to work with your iOS device, you have to get Apple certification as well. And this is on top of all of the other certifications. This is called the Made for iPhone program. Actually, actually this is a mistake. It's actually called the Made for iPad, uh, iPod, sorry. Uh, the program has been around since before the iPhone existed, so it's kind of historically new. But uh, this program is shrouded in secrecy. Uh, if one were a member of it, one could not congratulate or talk about what the terms of the contract said. But it's, uh, it's, it's difficult, theoretically. <laughs> it's expensive and it's very difficult just to get into the program, and there's a lot that, that needs to be done. Um, but essentially, this program says that you have to give Apple your product plans before you begin anything, before you begin design, and Apple has to approve them, which is nice. It's not like the, uh, the iOS store or the App Store. Uh, Apple has a chance to say no before you spend a bunch of money. That's, that's pleasant. Um, but you also have to have your hardware certified by the third party lab that Apple's choosing. And I've heard through the grapevine that the certification costs about 70K. And Apple can ask you whenever they want to recertify your hardware. Basically, Apple comes out with a device and they want you to recertify. 
be usable. So we have another 70 k we could add one. So this is kind of ancient. Um, it has the benefit that if you go through this, you get the, the pleasure of being able to put this lovely new iPhone logo onto your device. And that's nice. That also means you can probably sell it in the app store. Um, in addition, if your device is working with Apple stuff, you have to pay Apple a per unit royalty for everything you sell. And they don't publish what this royalty is, it depends kind of on what the device is, like old. Uh, but it's another point to consider. It means you probably can't sell anything for a dollar due to the royalty that Apple is probably higher than a dollar. So again, this is a lot of cost, and this is all on top of all the regulatory certifications that you've already made your own. Thousand dollars for a charge of packaging the logo is to even to even take it. That's just certification. You, you actually have to build this thing. You need an industrial designer, you need industrial engineering, you need manufacturing. Um, we want our stuff, our peripherals, we want them to be beautiful and simple and ergonomic, and we want people to look at them and go, oh. and they should make that sound. That's, that's, that's what they should do. They should, Swivel their hips and they should go, ah, oh, see it. So that, that takes industrial design, that takes skill. In addition, there is the fairly obvious aspect that the thing doesn't just break, you know, you need to be able to throw it across the room, and I should be able to clumsily not catch it in my not good left hand, and it should still be somewhat useful. So the industrial designer that you hire um, probably should not be accustomed to making things out of eggshells and fabric shaped crystal. Um, it shouldn't wear out within five days. It should last for some reasonably respectable period of time. Uh, you know, these things seem obvious, but there are tons of products that are brought to market that don't do this. It fits can't go through the wash. It fits can't go through the wash. Uh, and there was, um, I think, Java introduced a competitor to the Fitbit that had something like a 92% failure rate as soon as they were released to the public. And they wound up recalling all of them, paying all of them back, and then going out of business. Not how you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and there are other non obvious things. They're obvious when you think about them, but when you're kind of caught up in design, you don't necessarily think, well, I should make sure the toddlers can't swallow my thing and see the living daylights out of if you lick it, you should still live, for example. Uh, and again, these are not necessarily obvious, but they have to be thought of. And when we're, when we're making apps for the App Store, you don't have to think. You know, if someone licks the screen while my app is running around, they will die and their relatives will see me. Not a problem. Uh, and then finally, whatever your godlike industrial designer, industrial engineer designs, it actually has to be feasible. You would have to actually be able to take these plans to a manufacturing plant and have it, have it be realizable. And this can be difficult. If you get an industrial designer that's fresh out of college, you might design the coolest motherfucking thing you have ever seen, but you can't help it. You, know, you have to wait 50 years for the state of the art to catch up to this uh, You might burn through your venture funding in those 50 years. Okay, then you also need your electrical engineer. Uh, and this is a little bit easier, but it's still difficult. We need someone that can talk circuits, we need someone that knows what they're doing. Um, and for the type of peripheral device that we're talking about, these modern peripheral devices, this is mostly digital electronics. So it's almost like putting Legos together. It's not really all that tough. Uh, but still, if you do need someone that can do it, there are, there are things that need to be considered in our office. Um, the, the electrical engineer that you use has to consider the interface, the buttons, the display. Uh, you, as the person who's running the project, can say, well, there is no button, there is no display, it should just be dead simple, no IOs. Uh, that's what we should strive for. As, as Glenn said, try and avoid preferences. Buttons and displays, but the preferences, try and get rid of as many as, as possible. You know, but still, you probably need something. Um, as I said, we have to talk about the, the actual circuit. Someone has to come up with the circuit itself. Someone has to think the components that are going into the circuit. You know, you can't just say, well, the transistor. You can put a transistor here. You need to know which transistor it is. Um, <clears throat> someone has to actually come up with the design of the board that the circuit lives on. 
uh, there's tons of people who can do this, but it's something that has to be <coughs> has to be done. Someone does have to actually do it. You have to get these circuit boards manufactured somewhere. You're gonna have to figure out the pricing of this. I don't know how many people have been watching the Pebble and Kickstarter, but this is essentially where they've been for the last three or four months. They've been spending tons of time in Asia uh, going through prototypes and getting getting things done as far as the manufacturing goes. Um, and finally, we need to, to figure out some way of getting the actual components placed onto the circuit board. We're probably not going to do the, uh, the Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, we're just going to do your garage and soldering iron and you can model your, your devices by hand and probably going to be a lot of things in some way. Um, you have to think about power. Whatever your peripheral device is, it needs, it needs energy, and it needs some way of, of activating. So these two pictures that you see here, these are, these are two watches. One, the, the one on the bottom actually is my watch. Uh, and they're both illustrating the way that they are being charged. Okay, it's not a portable device. Uh, you can plug it into the wall. Great, that's easy. Go. You are almost definitely going to be making a portable device, so that's almost certainly not going to work. It can take batteries, that's fine. Um, customers, users, they sort of ate it when they're in the middle of the great moment when they want to take the photo of the person crossing the finish line and their device that takes photos for them is just run out of batteries and it's before. They hate carrying it to batteries around. Batteries are cool, maybe it's the right thing for, for whatever it is that you want to build, but there are definitely other options. They can be recharged. This is what most of our stuff is today. Uh, so, how, how is it recharged? You can charge it via USB, that's easy. Uh, it can have a charging plug like the two things in these pictures. Um, it can have a base station that it sits on. Or something that's becoming kind of popular right now is that it can use inductive charging. Inductive charging is where there's no actual physical contacts, uh, metal contacts between a base station and the device that's being recharged. You can just put the device near something and through the natural power of magnetics, uh, it gets recharged. Anyway, this is something that needs to be thought of during the design. And again, this is something that makes physicality a bitch. You don't have to think about any of this stuff when you're writing apps. I mentioned manufacturing. Manufacturing is difficult. You have to find a manufacturer. Your manufacturer is almost certainly going to be a big issue. And it's great. Second world countries becoming third world countries. Sweatshops, not so great. So there are ethical concerns, and you know maybe if your cat is going to one of you, you don't give a shit. But uh, most people do, and you have to try and find an ethical manufacturer, and that can be very, very difficult. This is also there, there, there's a, a business case for this as well. If you don't find an ethical manufacturer, then you might end up in a situation like Apple, where you have your times expose to so maybe you're not the, the whole manufacturer. You probably don't want that. Um, so ethics are important. Uh, the cost of manufacturing is also important. To get a manufacturing run going, you're probably only going to get over a thousand dollars just to walk in the door. So again, you need money. You need some sort of funding. You need some sort of money to do this. Um, the logistics of manufacturing are difficult because you basically need it to be manufactured right around when you want to sell it. You don't want to be filling up warehouses with a product that you know hopefully you may sell it sometime in the next five years and just get Space in the meantime. Your device probably doesn't have a shelf life for five years. So there's a lot of logistics involved. Uh, there's the distribution. You have to actually get this thing from the manufacturer to the person that's going to use it. Do you FedEx it? Do you put it in the mail? Do you hand over it for yourself to each person to buy one? You probably don't do that, but you have to figure that out. Uh, you need some sort of agreement with the merchants if you want shelf space, if you want Target to be carrying your Fitbit. You have to negotiate that. You have to get Target to, to give you shelf space. And that shelf space is not free. Target wants your firstborn child for that shelf space. Uh, as I said, it's, it's expensive. All right. So we've basically talked about the things that make building this tough. But at this point, we've built it. It's, it's done. It's a physical object. But now it's just sitting there. It's not communicating. It's not part of your infrastructure. It's not part of your world. Modern peripherals need to actually talk to other stuff to do interesting things. We want them to have as little of an interface as possible. Ideally, the interface should be on our smartphones. 
that's easier for us. So our device has to communicate somehow. And the way that this generally happens is we have a Bluetooth. Bluetooth sucks. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about Bluetooth, I think of this dorky ass business clock uh, wearing his Bluetooth headset and kind of you know, making the dumb of face. And there's a reason that Bluetooth sucks. Bluetooth, it's a nice technology, but it's had very, very big political problems. Essentially, in the past, if you wanted to do something new with Bluetooth, something outside of predefined use cases, you needed to create your own Bluetooth profile. The predefined use cases are things like mice, keyboards, audio, so on and so on. They're, they're the things that you think of when you think of Bluetooth. If you wanted to do something different, you had to go to the Bluetooth special interest group and you had to say, here's the profile that I want to make. And they say, fuck you, and you go back and forth with them for a while. And after about a year, they might finally approve your, your new profile. At that point, you have to wait for the Apples and the Samsungs and the Googles to actually adopt your profile into their operating system. You can't do it yourself, they have to do it. That probably takes about three years. So at this point, you would have been waiting four years to, to start doing whatever it is that you want to do with your Bluetooth thing. Your market's dead, you're, you're screwed, you're doing the uh, 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 I don't know where I'm going with that, but, but, but it's not <laughs> You've changed businesses. Uh, Bluetooth, in the past, takes um, metric thought limits out to, to operate. It's a constant on connection. If you have a Bluetooth connection between your smartphone and your peripheral, basically it's always going, are you there? I'm there. Are you there? I'm there. Are you there? I'm here. Are you there? Yep. Cool. It's always beating back and forth, so it takes tons and tons and tons of power, and all batteries die instantly, and nobody wants to use it. Um, and finally, if you are using Bluetooth with an Apple device, you are obligated to be an Apple's made for iPad by an odd program. It's obligated. You have no choice whatsoever. You have to be in the program. So again, you have to figure out <coughs> how to get into that program. You have to sweet talk Apple until they let you in, and you have to start doing all of the seven thousand dollars of certification type stuff. So yeah, Bluetooth sucks. And then there's this whole thing about pairing. I'm sure that we've all seen this terrible prep pain of, of death where you type in the 74 digit number on your tiny little device with a keyboard and then you have to do something better and to change numbers with it. And it's, it sucks, pairing sucks. No one wants to pair devices. It's a pain in the ass. And it's the first thing that your users will ever have to do. The first thing that they see is this horrible pairing piece of shit user interface. So that's not nice. So basically that's why in the past we've seen these boring Bluetooth peripherals. We've seen mice, we've seen keyboards, we've seen very bad speaker systems, and we've seen douchebags wearing Bluetooth headsets. Alright, that was a lot of negativity. That was a lot of why it's difficult to make the peripherals. Uh, so let's 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 end with the negativity and let's talk about why now things are good. Bluetooth Smart, as I said, pretty much fixes all of those problems that I just mentioned with Bluetooth. The first big thing, this whole profile deal, it's gone. There's one profile, and every other function is built on top of that profile. That one profile is already adopted by all the major smartphone and smartphone manufacturers, which means you don't have to ask them for a thing. Basically, you can make whatever you want, and you can put it onto whatever smartphone you want, and you do not need any third party acceptance whatsoever. You can do it today. That alone is freaking fantastic. You don't need an MFI approval, you don't need to be an Apple's broker. Apple has made an exemption for Bluetooth Smart. If you're using the conventional Bluetooth, you still need to be an MFI. If you're using Bluetooth 4, Apple says, yeah, you know, we think this sucks too. You don't have to get our approval. You can do whatever you want. So that's, uh, that's 70 grand if you don't have to spend it. That's, that's pretty nice. That's, that's a bonus. If you're doing something startup y, having an extra 70 grand, that's helpful. Power. Bluetooth Smart Devices. Bluetooth Special Interest Group's marketing says that a basic device can operate for a year, one year, on a point cell battery. 
Compare that with the standard Bluetooth devices that you have that are out of batteries in two days. A year is pretty nice. If you can go for a year on a cell battery, then you have a lot of new opportunities that you didn't have before. Also, you have the opportunities that you can actually do whatever you want as far as your Bluetooth communication goes. So, all of a sudden, there's all kinds of new opportunities here. Okay, but it's not perfect. There are some limitations with Bluetooth Smart. The first one is that whereas with Bluetooth traditional, it's an always on connection, it's always communicating, you can stream data back and forth. With Bluetooth Smart, it's optimized for very small transmissions. The type of transmissions like what is the current temperature in the room, what is the current heart rate, things like that. Things that are very fast, things that are very quick, things that are very small amounts of data. You can, of course, change it to make bigger communications, but if you're going above maybe 50k, it might start getting a little bit So you have to think about your use case. If it's something where you need streaming or where you need a constant data connection, maybe you can do some it's also optimized for infrequent transmissions. So where Bluetooth traditional, as I said, streaming, Bluetooth smart, about once a second, maybe twice a second, maybe three times a second, you have some very small transmission. If you need anything faster than that, higher bandwidth than that, maybe you need to go back to traditional Bluetooth. Something else that makes Bluetooth smart cool is even though it's a fairly new technology, there are already some turnkey modules available on the market. So this picture down here, this is one of the turnkey modules. In real life, this is about the size of a quarter. This is very, very small. Um, and this, this turnkey module, this is something where a manufacturer has gone and basically integrated a Bluetooth chip, a Bluetooth antenna, and a couple of other miscellaneous components. And more importantly, they've gotten the radio frequency certified for you. So essentially that means all those certifications that I showed earlier, that got a lot less complicated now. If you can use one of these, these premium modules, they have done the certification, you buy the thing and you're automatically certified with Bluetooth stuff. Because they've already gone and put this thing together for you, it also reduces the engineering effort that an electrical engineer is going to have to do. Okay, putting one of these together, it's not super tough, but you do have to worry about antennas. You have to worry about the way that the antenna is laid out on the circuit board. These things are not trivial. And the fact that they have gone and done this for you, it's less work than you have to do. Of course, this comes at a cost, which is that the turnkey module is significantly more expensive than the chip itself. But if you're small, if you're doing something fairly modest, this is probably a pretty big one. You've lost a lot of the game certification, and you've lost a lot of the game engineering effort. Moving forward, We've talked about all these different pain points, and we've talked about how Bluetooth fixes a lot of these pain points in one go. There are a couple of other things that are both popular and becoming feasible right now that's making the peripheral market just huge in the next couple of years. It's just fairly good. We're seeing things like the Lifted Fuel and the Fitbit. These are definitely the precursors. This is the way. So, the first thing, there's a lot of hobbyist and maker influence. It's becoming very easy to just play around with stuff. And in the electrical engineering side, there's an Italian project called Arduino. And Arduino is a, you're familiar with this, Arduino is a microcontroller project that basically lets you very easily play with embedded electronics. So what you see here in the picture is the Arduino Uno R3. And in real life, this is about this big. It's fairly small. The, it has an IMP that you can use to program it, but the IMP itself is based on processing. Processing, uh, if you're not in layer 3 level, well, processing is a language in IDE that was invented basically for the education market and for the artistic market. It was invented with the idea of making it very easy for visual people to cool looking stuff. So basically, from the ground up, Arduino is designed with keys and knots. The actual code that you write to program uh, these Arduino things is based on wiring. Wiring is an outgrowth of processing, so again, it's something that's, that's very easy to pick up. You don't have to write an assembly language. I mean, when I began writing microcontrollers, it was down to the bare metal assembly language. And while it's fun, it's not necessarily something that's particularly fun. 
fact that we can use these very easy languages is extremely, extremely nervous. Uh, the wiring language is based on C and C++, so it's probably going to be fairly familiar to all of us. Um, it's easy. And this Gitto R3 costs 30 bucks. So there is absolutely no hurry to get it over. So you can spend 30 bucks today and tomorrow you can have all these things and you can plug it into your computer. And you can start making lights with the on and off and So just to kind of go over the specs, it has a USB connection. Uh, there's no driver needed, even if you're on a portable Windows, you don't need to install a driver, you can just plug this thing in and talk to it from the terminal. Uh, obviously, from the IDE, if you're in the Windows IDE. As far as the, the pins, it has 14 digital in, uh, IOs, it has um, 6 PWM. PWM is something uh, that is pulse width modulation. You can use it to sort of simulate um, an analog signal that can go from 0 to 1 or at any range in between. It's not really doing that, you can simulate that. Um, and it has six analog inputs, which are basically analog and digital converters. You can give it an analog input and it will tell you the intensity is going from 0 to 2.5. Uh, 32 kilobytes of flash, 16 megahertz chip speed. Um, to our iOS added frames, this seems extremely modest, but you're doing embedded stuff. This is actually overkill for most projects. This is a lot of muscle control. Uh, you probably do not need anything near this much for whatever reason. And finally, as I said, the development tools, they're free and they're very, very easy to use. Uh, this little mini program, this is just from Wikipedia. Uh, there's not much going on here. I think it's basically, yeah, it's basically just turning a, a light on and off. This is sort of a hello world of the, uh, of the embedded, the embedded domain, turning the light on and off. However, if this really is a kill, or if that 30 bucks is too expensive, there's something kind of interesting on Kickstarter right now. It's, uh, it's being touted as Arduino's little brother. It's not an official part of the Arduino project, but it's fully compatible with Arduino, and it probably will become an official part. Um, it's called DigiSpark, and it is tiny, tiny, tiny. Basically, you can see that it's just barely bigger than the USB key that's plugged into it. Um, it's one little tiny chip and a little tiny bolt right there. Uh, <coughs> it's about the size of a quarter as well, but it costs 48 of them. It costs 12 bucks. So if you get a quick read on Kickstarter, I think it's only 10 bucks. Um, they're, I think they're up to manufacturing now. They've totally exceeded their Kickstarter funding goals, so it's, it is something that's happening. Um, obviously, it has built in USB. You can see that since it's plugged in. You can do serial on-chip debugging over the USB, which is quite cool. So you can actually do debugging from, from the computer, you know, you're on chip. Um, as far as the specs go, it has six different pins, three PWMs, and four analogs. So this is actually pretty similar to what we saw before, despite the fact that this one is teeny, teeny, tiny. Uh, this is a little bit technical, but it supports two different buses. There's one called I squared C and another called SPI. In the electrical engineering world, these are the two most common ways for chips to communicate with one another. Uh, basically, this means that this little Arduino guy can very easily communicate with whatever other chips you want to put into your product, whether that be a GPS or a cell stack, a cell, sorry, a cell stack or whatever. Uh, it's, it's capable of communicating with these things right from the start. And the Arduino project has tons of open source libraries that the sales of this. Um, yeah, so this is cheap, this is easy, it's kind of easy, but it's, it's nice and, and definitely a way to get. Um, as far as electrical engineering goes, something else that's fairly new in the last couple of years is that there are tons of online uh, support forums and, and ways of finding out how to do things. Um, there are general merchants online. Um, probably the most well known in the obvious naked community is called SparkFun. And to be honest, I just discovered these guys about six months ago, but they are freaking excellent. They sell everything that you can imagine. They're probably not the cheapest, but they're not really expensive. But their support is just unrivaled. They have video casts, they have forums, they have how to's, they have tons of resources that will get you going. And more importantly, if you have a problem, they will actually answer you. Through your mail and give you advice. Uh, 
That's pretty cool. There is not that many people that you can write to and say, oh, I need an electrical engineering device, and they'll actually answer you. That's pretty cool. Uh, there's Digikey. This is kind of the grown up version of Spark. Digikey is, uh, is a company that provides electrical components to actual people that are manufacturing stuff. Uh, they have prices by, by one unit, by 10 units, or by a million units. So you can tell what they, what they do with it more. Um, they're more generalized support uh, sites. One of the most, mm -hmm. most sorry, one of the most well known is the EEV blog with some dude named Dave. And Dave makes videos, YouTube videos that are about three minutes long. And in each one, he goes from start to finish on some electrical engineering project and tells you in a very compelling way how to implement it. These are super well done. I mean, I am really impressed by these. They are extremely well done. Uh, there's Fritzing. Fritzing is an outgrowth uh, of the Arduino project, and Fritzing is a site that essentially gives you a lot of uh, open source designs and open source reference for engineering, for electrical engineering. And then finally, there's opensurface.com, which is exactly what it's in. Non-open circuit is in a non-functional circuit, and open circuit is in an kind of open source circuit. So, tons of places to get support, tons of places to, to bootstrap your abilities. Something else that's become very convenient as far as putting together peripheral devices is the, the growth of 3D printing. So, in the past, if you wanted to make something, you needed to actually figure out the manufacturer, probably in Asia. You needed to say, hey, can I make one unit? And they would say, ha ha ha. And you would repeat that process a hundred times until you found something that would actually make your prototype. You don't have to do that anymore, it's 3D printing. So, what we see here is an example of something that's been printed in a 3D printer. Um, <coughs> these are still expensive, but they're nowhere near what they used to be. Maybe just five or six years ago, a 3D printer would cost twenty to fifty thousand dollars. Now it's in the one to two thousand dollars range. So that's a big difference. So I'll just kind of talk about a couple of the most popular solutions here. Um, one of our, our general colleagues in this uh, Apple development arena is a guy named Bill Bumgarner, who uh, I think he works on the Xcode developer tools. He may have switched on. I'm not quite sure. But I think that's what he does. Um, but he has an interesting blog called uh, Do It Friday or something? Yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll put it in the notes afterwards. Uh, but he has an interesting blog where he talks about a lot about his experience with 3D printing. Uh, so this is the Ultimaker. Um, I think this costs around $2,000. Um, there's the Up Plus, which is another 3D printer. Uh, there's the MakerBot, which has Fairly nice marketing, but my understanding is that it's actually a less than nice 3D printer. Uh, and there's the RepRap, which clearly is the solution for the beats that are building themselves. But in any case, there are lots of solutions here as far as the 3D printing. Um, <clears throat> so let's say that you've actually gone ahead and played around with 3D printing and you've got something going. Well, you still have this whole problem of manufacturing in Asia and blah, blah, blah. No, actually, you don't, because there are now a whole bunch of solutions online that will take your 3D printing um, file and print something for you, and you can handle the distribution. Um, so the most well-known of these is called Onoko, 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 you pronounce it somehow. Uh, but basically, these guys will manufacture your device for you, and they will sell it for you on their web page, and they will ship it to you and whoever buys it, and they'll give you the money. All of it, but they'll give you most of it. I have not actually dealt with these guys myself, but uh, they seem like they, like they know what they're doing. So that's another big pain point that's going You don't necessarily have to worry about manufacturing until you've gotten big enough that you decide if you want to worry about manufacturing. Uh, there's a company called Tech Shop. Um, I think that they're US only. These guys have an actual physical space in a couple of different cities. In San Francisco, for example, they have all the shops. I'm learning how well with them at the end of September. So that's pretty cool. Uh, they teach CAD CAM, they teach uh, 3D printing, they teach 3D modeling, they teach injection molding. Um, so you can get up to speed with all these technologies yourself just by paying them, I think, $60 or so and going to one of their workshops. 
Once you've done that, you can go and use the tools for the very small fee. Uh, and then just to kind of round this out, there's another company called IDC Mods. I don't know a lot about these guys, but again, you give them your plans and they will do the interaction for you and then ship to whoever you want. So, as I said, this is something that's been very, very difficult to do in the past. This whole idea of going from ones and zeros to physicality to actually building something, it's been, it's been very tough because of all of these different factors, because communication's been difficult, uh, because the actual engineering has been difficult, because the actual manufacturer has been difficult, because the certification has been difficult. But right now, we have sort of a perfect storm of trends that are converging that are making this suddenly very, very easy. And I believe that we're going to be seeing an inflection point in the number of peripherals in the smartness of peripherals that are being released and introduced in the next couple of years due to all of these things coming together. So basically, we have the Arduino that makes it super easy to test your embedded logic and to prototype your circuitry. Uh, we have online electronics stores and support, things like SparkFun, things like EEB Blog, uh, things like Open Service. All of a sudden, it's super easy to get this stuff, and it's super easy to find out where you made a mistake. It did not used to be that. We have 3D printing. All of a sudden, it's super easy for you to make your own prototypes. You no longer have to go find someone to do it for you. You no longer necessarily have to hire an industrial designer or engineer right from the start. You can get going yourself today. All of a sudden, we have people that will actually make the stuff for you and handle your distribution. This used to be almost impossible unless you had a system in the box. Now you can do it yourself. Last but not least, we have Kickstarter. If you do need money, we have a fairly easy, fairly well accepted way for you to get it. For you to actually tell people, look, I want to build this, I want to send it to you, here's what it is, give me some cash so I can do it. Clearly, this is a model that works, clearly, people are doing it, it's available to you, you can get your peripheral off the ground right now. And finally, we have Bluetooth Smart, which actually makes your peripheral capable of talking to the world around it, but it used to be very, very difficult to do. So, that's the perfect storm of peripherals, and I am Jason Harris, and I hope you enjoyed your talk, and I hope you enjoyed the, well, I guess the last bit of the conference before the panel. Oh, uh, do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have time for one, one question. Um, cool. yeah. I guess I should consider myself a very good guy, almost, yes, as a, as a friend. Um, one last thing, I wanted to be, uh, since you're an American guy, you probably overlooked that Keystar apparently only works for US citizens. Ah, I all people have a bank account in the US. That's what I heard. I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah, that's what I heard, yeah, just double check it anyway. The thing I want to point out is there are other options which aren't as famous as Keystar. Yeah. I mean, that would kind of make sense because only Americans have, you know, skills. That's why, yeah, it's probably the most interesting. Most interesting style of that's sort of implication. That's a shame, actually. I hope that they figured that out. I'm not, again, might be not true. Alright, who has a question? Or has anybody else? No, it's just keep the question in your mind and write it down somewhere in a paper because we're going to have some panel in about 15 minutes. Then again, we'll have time to ask questions for all of us. Alright, so let's take a break, 15 minutes, and uh, we'll be back.